hey, this is 42. I had an experience recently where I was in a uh, YouTube chat for Brother Ox channel. And I'm actually, I'm going to send this to him. I'm going to send this to Chani. I'm going to send this to Sean and people that were on there. It wasn't really the proper way to communicate this. Homo sapiens did not breed with Neanderthals, modern Homo sapiens. I'm saying that because the evidence has, has convinced me of it, in spite of it being more of a, you know, with the consensus saying otherwise, the mainstream saying otherwise. So I'm just going to bring the sources. I'll be transparent about my biases, about other people's biases involved in this. So I'm going to, as quickly as I can, without, you know, to take something, a phrase from Wu Jiao, without microwaving it too much, I'm going to show you what convinced me. And more importantly, I'm going to get into how this is interwoven with a larger misconstruct. I want to present the first source. Now, this isn't one of the core four sources. This is mainly, and I'm going to have sources that disagree with me. This is more of a perspective source. This is from, or was published in the National Library of Medicine. It's called Population Genomics and the Statistical Value of Race. There's more to this ridiculously long title. It's from Kofi Maglo and his team. This is a quote. However, the problem with cladistic theories of race is that human populations show crisscross the lineages to an extent that a classification that takes into account evolutionary relationships in the nested pattern of diversity would require that sub-Saharan Africans are not a race because the most exclusive group that includes all sub-Saharan African populations also includes every non-sub-Saharan African population. It's a good read, awfully good read. These are some of the graphics from the study. There were some previous studies, 2011, I think it was Barbara Johnny, 2009, Bale, that made the case that admixture did not occur with Neanderthals. I remember, if not those studies, other studies that said the same thing. And I remember how this changed. And you started to hear mainly, I think it was coming from the Max Planck Institute, that admixture of Neanderthals did occur. And it, it only occurred with people outside of Sub-Saharan Africa. That always seemed fishy to me, just because of the nature of human migrations. So be it that, and this is getting to myself as a source, and there, this needs a little bit more narrative. So as we, you know, because I want to show you what convinced me, because I wasn't always, I was skeptical from the get, because this whole everybody except Sub-Saharan African, that screams Eurocentric bias, and, and within bias mistakes are made, or it's just straight up propaganda and it was a mistake. I don't know, but I, I, I scrutinized, scrutinized it. I side-eyed it. And what I discovered was low key, you would hear, okay, these Africans are mixed with Neanderthal. These Africans are mixed with Neanderthal. And it, it wouldn't get a whole lot of play. It would be like Khoisan, Yoruba, Luya. So I'm like, shit, you know, he's naming pretty much uh, East African, West African. It just, it wasn't a lot, but it was a, a real signature. Now, at the time, I dismissed it as back migration. What changed is there was a person, um, XYY man, an Egyptian. And I mentioned to him, I'm like, because I had read Sars' book, Nesabidi, that talks about the Yoruba migrating from the Sudan. And I said, well, maybe that's why they got a little Neanderthal, because they was mixing the people in Asia. And he made the point, X by Y man, he said that, no, that this didn't go down, that Homo sapiens did not breed with Neanderthals. When he made that point, I, had, I was familiar with him enough to where I realized he was no fool. So I didn't jump at him like, okay, he wrong, he must not know, you know, because consensus science and all these studies, they're saying this and he's saying something else. I realized that there was a method to his madness. There were some real reasons that he had. And I had remember reading, actually, I didn't even read it. I just read the headline of a study from Cambridge that said that Homo sapiens and Neanderthals didn't breed. Another thing XYY man showed me, and he put this on, a, on Egypt Search Reloaded, was that the Neanderthals tested so far had the pigment genes, the same pigment genes as dark-skinned people. There is a Eurocentric bias because black people, if we were to find that, we would just, the title of the study in the articles would be Neanderthals are black. And this is so far true with, I think we've only had like four Neanderthal genomes, but the Neanderthals that have been tested so far have had the same pigment genes as dark-skinned people. XYY man was the person who pointed that out. And it was the first time I really fact checked what he was saying because he was speaking more like like um, a black man in the sense. And I think he is, but in the sense that he would just 
come to the conclusion, oh, Neanderthals are black. Instead, like this had a vague uh, art, um, title for the article, and you would never actually get to that conclusion unless you read article down to the actual genes within the article. Like you'd have to have some sort of literacy to, to actually come to that conclusion. So I developed enough of that to read the article, verify it, and made a video about it. And the video was called Black Neanderthals and Eurocentrism. This leads to what really will be my first core source. If you look under the comments in that video, and I'm, this gets to somebody's personal ancestry test, so I may be a little vague intentionally, but if you want to fact check this, you can just follow what you're seeing on the screen. So this, this will be a source that refers to the video. It's one of the reasons I did a video response, even though I'd rather have something in paper. There will be the sources in writing in the description or where I, where I post it. So the sources will be available in writing. And I may publish something. I, I had somebody offer to publish something. So this was a while ago. I don't know if the offer still stands. I got to get back with them. I was just too busy at the time. For now, this is how, how I'll, I'll need to put this source out. So I might as well just make a video and include the rest of the sources. Um, this is in the comments on the video, Black Neanderthals and Eurocentrism. He says, Neanderthal DNA is well found in Sub-Saharan Africans, my brother. Update your video. And I said, I stated it in the video. So he says, sorry, I assumed you were one of the videos by Euronuts moving the goalposts. He said my brother at first, but he thinks I'm a Euronut. And I, I think what he's saying is like a lot of people are influenced by Euronuts. I don't know. But anyhow, he says, uh, videos made by Euronuts moving the goalposts. Neanderthals used to be dumb, but now they are Einstein. That he kind of mixed that in made me a little bit suspicious, right? But then I'll read this comment later and he says, a few days ago, my 23andMe results show that I am 98.02 Sub-Saharan and have 58 Neanderthal variants. Born and raised in Burundi, both sides of parents or grandparents, both raised there. I wanted to see this. I was skeptical, but when he said it the second time, like in the second comment, I was thinking he's probably telling the truth. I looked up his Facebook and he posted it on Facebook. So it's public. So I don't really have a problem putting it out there. This was telling to me. 58 Neanderthal variants really isn't that much. But when I compare it to a friend of mine, D'Angelo, He's 15% European, and he has 44 Neanderthal variants. He has less. Now, neither of them have more than like a quarter of 1%. But it does show that the fellow from Burundi did not get his Neanderthal variants from anybody but Africans. The reason why I know this is, is because 23andMe and National Geographic, they have tested far more of Europe just other groups in general, if they find some ancient ancestry that Africans don't have, it would not be another. It would be in in uh, papers. It would be in journals. So it errors against African DNA. That's why you have somebody who's 98% Sub-Saharan African. It's for a lack of testing of other people within his region. You've got damn near 2%. I think it was like 98.1. They got them at 0.3 European. But he has more Neanderthal variants than D'Angelo, who is uh like I think 13. What, what are you, D'Angelo? Let, let me look this up. 15% European. 15% and 0.3%. That tells me that the Neanderthal variants that the fella from Burundi has came from Africans. That made me look out of the box. And then I noticed another study. And this study is interesting. I'm going to use this as source three, even though source two is still going. Ancient DNA reveals into Africa migration. Let me read a quote from this source. This is not one of my core sources. Matter of fact, this disagrees with me because I don't believe that there was into Africa migration on that level that they're claiming in this source. And they're claiming this after they tested Motaman. I don't remember offhand. I think Motaman is like 30,000 year old uh, an Ethiopian, they make this claim. And it's also interesting to discover now that even Sub-Saharan Africans have a bit, 0.3 through 0.7% of Neanderthal ancestry. There's also a comment from David Reich in this. So he's kind of that media dude, especially with the BBC. Now, what's interesting about this, before I could even question it, it was corrected. So I'm going to use the correction of this as source four. And again, this is these are not my main, my core sources. But this is within source two. So source four is from nature.com. 
News, error found in study of first ancient African genome. They're still talking about modem yet. Okay. And I'm going to quote that. This is source four. It says, almost all of us agree that there was some back to Africa gene flow, and it was pretty big migration into East Africa, says Skopaglund. But it did not reach West and Central Africa, at least not in a detectable way. The error also undermines the paper's original conclusion that many Africans carry Neanderthal DNA inherited from Europeans whose ancestors had interbred with the group. Now, this bothered me on two levels, because one, I became curious as to what level of disagreement they have with this back to Africa gene flow. More than that, because they say it was pretty big around East Africa. When they start saying that, it, it's, um, it alerts me that this claim in Egypt. They're probably trying to get into Egypt with this in some way. So I'm a little bit alerted to that, but whatever, because I'm, you know, it could be, if you consider major gene flow to be Bedouins going back and forth, or if you consider it to be a later gene flow from, from the major empires that were invading, I wouldn't disagree with it. But I do get a little bit alert, alerted. Anyhow, the thing that really stood out to me was now he's saying, without this back migration, that the Neanderthal ancestry of 0 0.3 and 0 0.7 doesn't exist. That alerted me, because now it's, so it's sounding like they only want to count Neanderthal ancestry in Africans if it's through back migration. Which... At, at the time, I'm, you know, I'm making, trying to make heads or tails out of this, right? And 0 0.3 through 0 0.7 is kind of high. You know, that's like more than North Africans. So now you're saying Sub-Saharan Africans have, have that? Like, that's, that's like Southern Europeans sometimes. They have as few as like 0 0.7. If you read that article, that's one of the reasons I sourced it. It doesn't really explain how they made the mistake. Like the mistake was a computer error. Like they left out a file. Because I'm trying to explain this now. I'm just trying to explain, well, maybe this is related to the dude from Burundi. And maybe that 0 0.3 through 0 0.7 was really mode of man. And so I'm looking at other, like other known archaeological genomes. I'm looking at Os. You may have heard of him. 6 to 9 percent Neanderthal, 42,000 year old. I like to round it to that, but in that estimate, he had 6 to 9 Os. That made me think, well, why did he decrease? Is this an earlier bottleneck? Was everybody just closer? And Africans may be less so because they were close to people and mixing with people that had none of this. But in general, was everyone closer in the past because you're closer to your shared ancestry? And I started hearing people like I, they, they would have the same question and it would be shared ancestry. With that in mind, I started to really visualize this, as you'll see right here. This is a good visualization where it shows non-Africa. In comparison to just regions of Africa, like this is East, West, Central, North Khoisan, Southern Khoisan. In that nature, you can see the difference in diversity. I'll show you another one. This is the mitochondrial lineages of modern humans. All of these are found in Africa. The ones that start with L are most common in Africa, but the ones that don't like M, N, R, the ones that you're seeing here, you don't see the later branches that you don't find in Africa, but all the early out of Africa branches are found in Africa. And they're found with earlier branches within Africa. Down near all this page, except for the, the things that you can't see, are within Africa. And, and yes, it's true. A lot of the L's leave Africa too. Like L3 makes it big in Turkey. You know, it's L3 is, um, L2 is in Spain. Like you have L's that, that leave Africa. L, L0, I think, is, is in Turkey too. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. And this is another example of how out of Africa groups are, they spread Kleinile, and that's, that's kind of a word that I've heard sourced before only once, and it was in relation to this. And what they mean is it's like a climb, like an incline. You know, like when you're lifting weights, you go up slowly, and it's all, everything's connected. You know, like an amoeba moves, that humans move like an amoeba. Like we move together, and, and when we get into one spot, we twirl around a little bit. So people do move, but the thing that isn't factored a lot of times in population genetics is that at one point there was nobody else outside of Africa. So it was a completely different ball game. Once you stepped out, you were 100% of the genome and you didn't mix as much with the bulk of the human family tree. So they bottlenecked. When they bottlenecked, they lost diversity. However, they maintain a higher percentage of what they had in the past because they didn't mix with the new. What people had in the past, as shown with, I believe, with Motorman, even though they didn't say that 0 0.3 to 0 0.7 was him, but definitely with Ose, because nobody's that high in Neanderthal now. And you see this with these archaic maps, 
where the further you get out of Africa, the more Neanderthal and the more Denisovan people have. Even to the point where if like you look down here in this island on the outskirts beyond Australia, which you see is a three classified Neanderthal. Now, this is about as far away from Neanderthals. You can see it with these map too. This is this is really far away from Neanderthals. You know, we don't even, I don't think, no, I think Denisovans, I don't think they were in the islands. But what you see is the people that are less diverse have a higher percentage of archaic, not the people who live next to Neanderthals. So what I theorized was that that is why they have more Neanderthal. Simple as that. Less diversity, less likeliness to, to uh, breed with people who have no Neanderthal at all. And that's the nature of a substructure. That's source two. That's how I came to the conclusion. But what I wanted to do now is I'm like, well, if I come to this conclusion, what did Cambridge come with? Because I had heard of the study before. The source five in this picture right here is from a magazine article that that um, presented source five. But I don't, I don't know. I don't remember if this was actually a part of the fi figures. I don't know if this came from source five, but it's a estimation on how this may have worked. And really, the numbers are kind of whatever. The people who would have Neanderthal genes are the people who had it in that substructure in early modern humans, people on the outskirts of Africa, mostly in the north. And those were some of the main people to leave and go to Europe, the descendants of them. Now, when they went to Europe is another matter that I'll get to. But anyhow, source five, because I go back to the uh, that Cambridge article. This is a Cambridge article. This is the one from 2012. And I'm going to read um, the conclusion from that. It says, we show that the excess polymorphism shared between Eurasians and Neanderthals is compatible with scenarios in which no hybridization occurred and is strongly linked to the strength of structure in ancient populations. Now, how they show this is math. And that's another thing I need to, to, to bring up to Ahn. He's talking about this as an old source. It's not. It ages blended because it's math. And the population databases that they use for these studies, those aren't really updating heavy anyway. You know, some of the same people that weren't tested then have not been tested now. Like the people, like I mentioned, Main B2, people in the Congo, Burundi, 1.8% of unknown in Central Africans because they haven't been tested. The Cambridge study sourced an anthropology article from 1993 to build the argument that there were continued out of Africa migrations that were more recent, which blended into the populace like Klein. Kleinile. They source older sources. That's my point. That this is from 2012. The real question is, how, is there anything better than it? Is there anything that disproves it? Is there anything that adds to the case for admixture? And sort of indiscriminately, I just started reading whatever popped up, whatever sources were out there. So I'll make this source six. Science mag, humans, Neanderthals made it earlier and more frequently than thought. I'm seeing articles like this, and they're not convincing me, but they are showing me that they seem convinced. So they're posing things based on the other model that there was admixture. Now, if you look at this article, and that's why I'm like, this right here, this is not a core, core source. This is a give you more of a fuller picture source. Okay. And it says, I'm quoting it now, new analysis of her ancient genome has found that this so called Altai Neanderthal inherited DNA from modern humans from Africa, including the gene that may have been involved in speech. We, we only have like four Neanderthal sequence. Why are we assuming that they didn't already have a, a gene for speech? I'm reading this and I'm like, huh? Well, this don't make no sense. Then it goes on to say, this is the first genetic evidence that early modern humans met Neanderthal and bred with them earlier than we thought, says author Sergei Castellano, an evolutionary bi biologist at the Mass Lake Institute. Push that out there for people and nobody can under, can explain to me why they're making this jump and there and i'm starting to see other examples of this i'm also not quite ready to teach it i'm looking at different sources so i said well can i find one other source that makes the same argument as the cambridge article maybe one that's a little bit more recent and i found it because i, I was reading through i was lurking a debate on it on this subject and this source was given i'm going to pull this up Source, we'll make this source seven. Balancing selection on a regulatory region exhibiting ancient variation that predates human Neanderthal divergence. So let me see, when it, I think this source is 2013. 
So it's more recent, but it isn't hot off the presses. And I think this goes back to how the ancestry tests are monetized. This isn't what people want to share. Like if you look at it, it's had 22 shares. You look at it, 10,000 views, 22 shares. It's been cited 18 times. Since, 13, since 2013, it doesn't resonate as much. So I want to read a few clips out of this article because it makes a very similar argument. So this is it. Several scenarios can be a vision to explain the unusual genetic variation observed at the any one locus. Recent Neanderthal admixture exclusive with Eurasian populations. This is one. That's one. Two, back migration to Africa from Eurasia after Neanderthal admixture with Eurasian populations. And three, ancient African substructure maintained since human Neanderthal diversions. And they show figures for this. I'll put up these figures. It said, we determine the frequency of any one haplotypes among four African populations. YRY, that's Yoruba, ASW, that's African Americans, they even say that in Southwest USA, okay? Maasai in Kenya, and the Luya in Kenya. Oh, and also the Wubuye in Kenya, who I've never heard of, that's one of the 42 tribes I'm not really familiar with. From HapMap3 data set in the 1000 Genome Project, blah, 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 that's where they got the data set. And again, let me say, 2013, this has not changed that much. So this, this age is fine just because they aren't really updating Africans like that. So the presence of African Northeast uh, any one haplotypes does not support the first scenario, exclusive Neanderthal admixture with Eurasian populations. Recent reports have suggested that Neanderthals and Denisovans contributed their genetic material to present-day Eurasian populations and malnations, respectively. It gives the two sources for that. However, the variation that we observed at the any one locus is not consistent with direct archaic admixture as discussed in these pop publications. We did not consider Neanderthal admixture into ancient African populations because paleoanthropology studies only report interactions between Neanderthals and modern humans outside of Africa. The second scenario assumes back migration into Africa from Eurasian populations after that mixture of Neanderthal with Eurasian populations. If such that mixture occurred, the African any one haplotypes should represent a subset of Eurasian any one haplotypes. To test this, we again analyze the phase one data of the 1000 Genome Project, which includes 338 haplotypes from three African populations. Using the data set, we found the variation within African any one haplotype is significantly higher, this is key, than the variation within Asian and European any one haplotypes. This result indicates that African any one haplotypes have a longer coalescence, and as such, the presence of the any one haplotype among modern Africans cannot be explained by simple back migration and admixture of Eurasian haplotypes. This is a some of the figures from this study, and I didn't mention the author. I think the, the top name is Omer Gokyaman. This will be source eight. This is a source that doesn't agree with me. Again, this is an example of why the argument for admixture did not convince me. I'm starting to see flaws in it. This source is called Modern Humans Lost DNA When They Left Africa, Mating with Neanderthals Brought Some Back. It's by Ann Gibbons. And it doesn't cite an actual study, but that's the least of the problems with this. Listen, I'm reading from it. Today's Asians carry some ancient African genes. Hold on, what, what source would this be? I think I said source 10, source 8. So if I'm out of order, right, this will you can go by the title. But they got them from extinct Neanderthals. They also gave thousands of ancient African gene variants that your agents had lost when their ancestors swept out of Africa in small bands, perhaps 60,000, 80,000 years ago. I'm not even sure why I'm using this. This is, this is one thing I've noticed, that a lot of times these sources for admixture really start to sound amateurish because 60 to 80,000 years ago, that's maybe the first band that went to Australia. You just look at the um, haplogroups and take them literally, that there were no Eurasian populations six to eight thousand years ago they were too co coalesced with africa just going by the phylogenetic tree by, by the haplogroups the only haplogroups that are really that old that are completely out of africa are maybe the ones that went to the australian islands or, or into the Papuan islands so the the framework that's established is flawed from the get-go and i'm seeing this with the admixture components now i'll, I'll keep reading some more because there's something else in here that really made me question things and, and i was asking other people questions about this and they had problems with it too. In talks last week at the annual meeting of the American Society of Human Genetics, here researchers announced that some Neanderthal variants inherited by modern humans outside of Africa are not peculiarly peculiar. Who did, who puts L, uh, R L Y after peculiar? But anyhow, they aren't peculiarly. I can't pronounce the name Neanderthal genes, but represent the ancestral human condition. The work highlights just how much diversity was lost when people passed through a genetic bottleneck as they moved out of Africa. They left many beneficial variants behind in Africa, says evolutionary genomist Tony Capo Vanderbilt. 
University of Nashville reports the results and interbreeding with Neanderthals provided an opportunity to get some of those variants, to get back some of those variants, albeit with many potentially weak deleterious Neanderthal alleles as well. This team found the ancient African variants that they scrutinized the genomes of 20,000 people. Now listen, this team found the ancient African variants. Now, now he's calling them African. When they scrutinized the genome of more than 20,000 people in the 1,000 Genome product, Project in Vanderbilt's BioU data bank of electronic health records, they soon noticed a strange pattern. Stretches of chromosomes inherited from Neanderthals also carried ancient alleles or mutations found in all the Africans they studied, including the Yoruba, Esan, and Mende people. Researchers found 47,261 of these single base genes across the genomes of Europeans and 56,497 in Asians, Catter says. In Eurasians, these alleles are only found next to Neanderthal genes, suggesting all this DNA was inherited roughly at the same time, and ancestors of Eurasians made it from Neanderthals roughly 50,000 years ago. The most parsimonious, and they use this, I think, as a buzzword because I've heard this before in an article I can't find, but anyway, the most parsim parsimonious. <laughs> explanation is that the alleles represent the ancestral human condition inherited by Neanderthals and modern humans in Africa from the common ancestor. Capra says when people migrated out of Africa, their small numbers resulted in a bottleneck in which they lost many alleles that remained in larger populations in Africa. Later, the Neanderthals reinduced these alleles along with distinct Neanderthal genes to the ancestors of Eurasians. Capra says some of these ancient alleles were beneficial, such as one that boosted the immune responses. And I think that enzyme might have been the one that the previous source where it mentioned that anyone haplotype because that there, it was also there was also an enzyme associated with that that did boost immune responses see on one hand this did raise some questions i wanted to see how it was determined that there was a neanderthal section that seemed interesting and that seemed like it would actually make a case but there's no actual raw data to look at what this Neanderthal quote-unquote section is. On the other hand, they were claiming that these genes aren't even Neanderthal, and I'm seeing it, like like I said, with the fellow in Burundi. They're also relying on a 50,000-year out-of-Africa model, which is flawed completely. If that's their model, then that doesn't work, because it's contradicted by the Homo sapien phylogenetic tree and the age of haplogroups. I want to give another example. This is source nine. This is an example of a genetics study that considers other models. And this is from DNA Tribes. It's 2014. This is back before DNA Tribes was targeted and taken down. They, they were doing good work with their population database. And this study, it's called The First Human Diaspora, Basal Eurasians in the Horn of Africa Background, Out of Africa Migrations and Early Population Structure. This is a great example, and I think this study does have some flaws. It's a great example of how you can use deductive reasoning to track ancestry. And in doing that, they notice that certain African groups and sort of Southeast Asian groups are more related. And listen to that. I'm just going to read from a portion of this. They say, on, however, another possibility as to why they're related is that these shared African and Asian Pacific genetic components might reflect contacts the Denisovan-related archaic homonyms in Africa. That's an example of them considering substructure. And I want to get to source 10. And source 10 is also a core source. This is a source that came to the same conclusion as the other two. It's from William Amos in 2016. The title is The Quantity of Neanderthal DNA in Modern Humans, a Reanalysis Relaxing the Assumption of Constant Mutation Rate. So I'm going to read a piece of this. Few now dispute that a few percent of the DNA of non-African humans is a legacy of interbreeding with Neanderthals. However, heterozygosity and mutation rates appear to be linked such that the loss of diversity associated with humans migrating out of Africa caused a mutation slowdown, allowing Africans to diverge more from our common ancestor and Neanderthals. Previous studies have made a compelling case for a Neanderthal legacy in modern non-Africans. However, until now, the only alternate hypothesis was based on historical population substructure. And it gives a link for that possibility that is debated, there's a link against that, and difficult to resolve directly. Mutation slowdown provides a completely new alternative. Crucially, the mutation slowdown model makes a range of predictions that can be used to help distinguish it from introgression. Perhaps unexpectedly in every test I apply, the mutation slowdown model offers a better, more unambiguously better fit to, to the data than Neanderthal introgression model. My results therefore appear to be at odds with previous studies, a conflict that can be resolved in three ways three main ways. 
The idea of widespread interbreeding between modern humans and other hominins had been broadly and rapidly accepted, I'm sure in part because the idea of carrying their legacy is undeniably romantic. Another key element is that, so far, a plausible alternative hypothesis has not been available. Mounting evidence in favor of HL offers an alternative explanation for many or most of the observations used to infer in progression. From different patterns of base sharing were changes in apparent block size. The HL mediated mutation slowdown hypothesis fits better with a range of direct tests to fit in which opposing predictions of the two hypotheses are compared. Consequently, there is now a clear need to explain why mutation slowdown is so strongly favored before the idea of widespread Neanderthal legacy can be considered proven. Now, in this article, Will Mamus does concede that, okay, I'll read this, thus, while some interbreeding likely occurred as evident by the, by the finding of skeletons of admixed individuals, adaptive genes and imperative large contribution of Denisova DNA to the oceanic genomes, my results challenge the idea that non-Africans generally carry an appreciated Neanderthal legacy. Now, his three reasons, the DNA tribe source contradicts the one with uh, oceanic Denisovans, at least in a proposed different model. But there is also an example of skeletons that were originally reported to be admixed with Neanderthal until further examination. And I'll give that in uh, the next source. Also, he mentions adaptive mutation. That sounds a little pseudo, because I mean, if you look up adaptive mutation, that's not even 100 in large organisms. It's more something that's proposed in small organisms. Unless he's talking about something like the APOBEC enzyme from source 7, the haplotype source that I mentioned earlier, that might be, you know, the same enzyme that protects against HIV, which I think is a little suspicious. Source 11 is an archive from a study that, where it points out that a, um, a skeleton that was previously believed to have Neanderthal affinities doesn't. So that's source 11. Um, I'm not going to make this next source a source, but this is the type of critical thinking that you got to do. If I can find three sources that use formulas to predict and successfully demonstrate that you don't need introgression to explain Neanderthal, quote unquote, admixture, it wouldn't actually be Neanderthal or, or admixture at that point, then you've kind of got to ask if you don't need it, is, what's the most likely outcome. And at one point, you know, you say, well, people get horny, though, you know, it's a new chick, new type of woman, the Neanderthal, or whatever. Now, the problem with that is there's so many factors. And this, like I said, this, I'm not considering this a source, but there's a YouTuber, Bill Gade, and he's actually more of a, a research, independent research scientist and a media person in some respects, because he does a lot of his work on YouTube. But when I put out a, a video where at this point, I'm like, oh, okay, I got enough information. I can teach this. And I, I did a video saying that Homo sapiens did not breed with Neanderthals. And I was challenging Tara McCarthy. It was called, she's all wrong. She's all right shit. After that, I started seeing some of the Bill Gates videos and my recommendations. He did a 15 video series on just common sense stuff that we should be considering about why it's, it's not practical. And he covered even some things, uh, how it's not politically or how there's a political influence to it with the Max Planck Institute and with, like I mentioned earlier, with um, ancestry tests monetizing an aspect of your archaic admixture. But he also mentioned some things just like how regionally they were more separated than we consider, how physically they were more different, how a lot of times we'll, we won't tell the truth about Neanderthals. Like if you look at the people that are whitewashing Neanderthals, even though all the ones that have been tested so far have the same pigment genes as Africans. If you look at the people, one of the main persons that's done these recreations with these new pristine Neanderthals is Elizabeth Danes. She's also the person that does recreations for Egyptians when they're whitewashed. And I don't think he actually mentioned that, but he was he was kind of getting into some of the politics about it. About it. But one thing that, that, that stuck out more than anything was, was disease. Because there are places that we can't go to right now so that's like when that dude got shot up messing with the North Sentinelese. A lot of people didn't have any sympathy for him because they didn't have immunities to a lot of the modern uh, diseases that we have. They they don't have any of the shots. So they don't have um, any inoculation. 
and we're only separated by them from them by maybe like you know because they were early out of Africa migrants, so like sixty thousand years tops, you know sixty thousand years that's a lot, and you can understand why we would be sexually compatible, but we would not be cohabitable. You know, we'd end up killing each other, especially back then because people didn't have shots. I mean, we're talking Neanderthals, we're talking hundreds of thousands of years removed. This would have been a dangerous uh, endeavor. You know, Asakuchi, you're just going to have to pass up. That we, We've got to look at it like if it's not necessary, if you have different simulations to demonstrate why it's not necessary, why are you building off it? You know, wouldn't Ocam's razor say it didn't happen? Because there's other things that I'm not including. And we did 15 videos and each one made a decent point to a great point that this is improbable. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. But what if you combine improbable with it doesn't have to happen? Now, this next source, I'm not going to count. I'm not going to count this as a source too. I'm just going to be quick on this. But someone in Egypt search, someone who was kind of new, had a theory that Max, that the Max Planck Institute was trying to claim that Egyptians were white. And they made their case based on Abu Sir tests. And they put a, and I'll, actually I will include what's behind the source, because he went on to claim on, on Egypt search that they used to be a Nazi organization, and he had a lot of receipts on that. So I'll make that source 12, which tracks the Nazi progression of the Max Planck Institute. Because one thing about the Max Planck Institute, let's be real, they, you can look at Wikipedia, they did a study on Egyptians, and this is something that I just saw right here looking at Wikipedia, because this actually was changed. Now, thankfully, you got this little company right here. Let me see who did this. Info Galactic. <laughs> so, Info Galactic, they got the old one. They got the old one. See, this old test right here, as you can see, this was done by members of the Max Planck Institute. And the old report, before it was changed on Wikipedia, says, study published in 1993 was performed on ancient mummies of the 12th dynasty, which, now, now this is actually the new, how it was edited, which identified multiple lines of descent. This is my Wikipedia right now. But this right here, this is how it used to be. It says, one successful study from 1993 was performed on ancient Egyptian mummies of the 12th dynasty by Dr. Zavante Pabu and Dr. Anna Di Rienzo, in, which identified multiple lines of descent, some of which originated in Sub-Saharan Africa. This is key right here, because you can talk about how they used to be Nazis, but this is Nazi behavior. This is straight-up Nazi behavior. They did this test, and you can scour the internet, you won't find it. You will not find this test from 1993. Now, another thing that's Nazi behavior is how Wikipedia, this is what it used to say, I don't know when it was changed, but I remember it used to look like this. If not for Info Galactic, I would have no proof that it used to look like this. Savante so Pabu is part of the Max Planck Institute. Stuff like this, this is reasons why, like, um, Chief X was arguing with me that Nefertiti didn't have an ancestry test. And it's because Nefertiti's ancestry test isn't on Wikipedia. So you got the whole bigotry on Wikipedia as you can see right here, and with not having Nefertiti, Tuts, Akhenatans, Amenhotep's III, by not having their ancestry tests on Wikipedia. And then you take the Max Planck Institute, they do a test on Egyptians, and this is all you get. But when they do a test with Abu Sir, they release the test. It's all over the internet. The media pumps it out. It's on World Star Hip Hop, no kidding. Another thing that I've noticed, and this I'm not going to go too deep in, but you can, you can say that this came from me. The Abu Sir test was compared to ancient Anatolians. Based on my understanding of, of population genetics, when you look at Europe and Africa, people who are regionally close to each other are going to be more related. Now, the Mediterranean is sort of a break in the Klein Isle. I'm going back to that word, nature of, how, of regional ancestry. They compared the Anatolians, ancient Anatolians, which are people in Turkey, ancient Turkey, to Lower Egyptians and somewhat Middle East, but Middle Egyptians, later period. That is, in a way, rigging it so they'll be more related to them. Because not long after the test with Abu Sir, there were tests done on um, Tanzanians, Kenyans, ancient Tanzanians and Kenyans, uh, even um, Malawians further south. 
and it showed that they were related to the Abu Sir group. In this, you could have compared Abu Sir to those groups instead of the the um, Anatolians, and instead of making the case that Sub-Saharan African an a Sub-Saharan ancestry decreased in Egyptians or increased, that was the case they made that it increased from the ancient times to more modern, you could have said that ancient Egyptians came from Sub-Saharan Africa because you're seeing people that are related to them in Sub-Saharan Africa. Once they compared them to ancient Sub-Saharan Africans. So the narrative was biased. But more important than the narrative is why didn't you release the other tests? Like the whole thing is biased. If they take the test and they, you can scour their internet, you won't find it. If they do a test on an older region, because this was the 12th dynasty, the other one was, um, I think it was like 20 something and newer, and it's not released, that's, that's a problem, especially when you do release the test and it's all over the internet. So I had an email exchange with Vicente Pablo, and I'm going to ask him the same thing. I'm like, hey man, I want to do a, you know, a documentary on ancient Egyptian ancestry, and I want to see um, like that one test from 93. I can't find it anywhere, man. Like, you got a link to it? And no, I was not getting that link. He was not sending that. Matter of fact, he sent something. He was like, well, we know we don't have that, but we got some new tests. So I thought he was going to send the Abu Sir test, right? Instead, he sends this. And I'm going to make this Source 13 just because, just for just to clarify that this happened. And if you doubt me, I can show you the email and I can show you an original unedited copy of this. But why would he send me something on Neanderthals? And, and looking at Source 13, it, the finished copy is in nature.com. It really, it talks about, um, it talks more about how Africans bred with Neanderthals after Neanderthals left Africa. So this isn't so much about admixture uh, with modern humans leaving Africa, like I've talked about for most of this. This is sort of before that time. It was, it also did talk somewhat about modern admixture, more modern admixture, but it didn't really make that strong of a case. I looked for better sources on this. I looked for a source that would represent this argument better. And the best ones I could find, they they were making a mistake that to me is, is key to this whole video, why I did this whole video. The mistake that they're making is they're assuming that there was a Eurasian population 40 to 60,000 years ago. Because if there is no somewhat homogenous Eurasian population 40 to 60,000 years ago, then you're not actually seeing people who are breeding with Neanderthals. Instead, you're seeing people who are breeding with people who are more related to Neanderthals. I'll give you an example of how this is shoot more. I'll make this source 14. I'm just going to put this right from the Egypt search link. You can see a rare. This this is a study. It says a rare deep rooting DO African chromosomal haplogroup and its implication for the expansion of modern humans out of Africa. This is an extremely Eurocentric article. Because here's the thing, you're finding DO in Africa, an old haplogroup, right? Old older than the out of Africa migrations, right? But you have no you, that nobody's ever found in Homo sapiens a Neanderthal haplogroup. People all from the center of Africa all the way across the world and back are related to Neanderthals, yet you have no Neanderthal haplogroup. That to me, that right there is almost as, as much of a logic boost as a um, disease. That, that right, that's a clue that this, that right there is a big one. You show me a, a Neanderthal haplogroup and we can chit chat. So you're finding DO in Africa. Now notice what El Maestro puts. And notice this image right here. He says, here's one thing I find interesting with this study. Their lower bound dates are limited by the time of Neanderthal and aggression. That's what I mean. There's something larger at play right here. Nobody seems to take issue with Homo sapiens coming out of Africa. But they're shoehorning a model 100 to 77,000 years, 76 to 73,000 years, and then 47 to 28, they're just saying it was uh, E. But if you're finding C and FT in Africa, why are you pushing it 71 to 57? DE, they find that. C, F, this is, and looking at it, yeah, they are 
in this picture right here, they, they are not going with earlier with an earlier model because of Neanderthal. It's like it's it's like confirmation bias that's built up on itself. And this is an area where pages and pages of Wikipedia wrong. Now I'll give you an example. H is 20 to 25,000 years old. The earliest branch H1 is mostly found in Berbers. How can you have a Eurasian population when your greatest, uh, your largest female lineage has an early branch this, that is this large in Africa? And it's like I said, it's 20 to 25,000 years old. So even if you had wonton back migration, which you don't need to explain this, you're cutting a big chunk of your ancestry in Africa. And H is also found in West Asia. So how do you have a Eurasian population? I can do the same with R. R is 27,000 years old. And one of its earliest and largest branches is big in Africa. Most of the branches, the younger branches are found in Africa. You don't really have, R doesn't have like hard-coded only in Europe ancestry until 8,000 years ago. You know, this is a Neolithic migration. And you can make a good argument for R being a very Mediterranean haplogroup because of the way it just blow torches in many directions. I could I you know I could go on. Now that's a big argument. I could make a, a, a case for R coming from Asia, coming from Africa, coming from Europe. It is a blowtorch. The thing about Africa though, Africa had the mutations leading up to R. Including that's why you see haplogroup K. It's not haplogroup P, you'll see those. They're not totally common, but they're not common anywhere. So the difference with Africa, if you're gonna make a case for Africa is that they show up in spite of all the competition genetically with other lineages because it's the bulk of the human family tree as i showed earlier you know that's the thing like i would debate anybody you see when it comes to neanderthals i got three core sources really and i i've got myself as a source when it comes to someone saying that there was a real population that you can define that could have uh, mixed with Neanderthals 50 to 60,000 years ago, a uh, real Eurasian population back then. I bleed sources. Sources come out all the time. I mean, just recently, that one that I was talking about with, um, like, I could use David Reich as a source, because he had a source with some uh, ancient Neolithic um, herders and, and hunter-gatherers in East and Central Africa with Tanzania. And there were two. There, there was the Lux Manda, which is Tanzania, and, that, and there was that recent one. When you study ancient Africans from Malawi to Abu Sir, they show that they're related to out Africa groups. And it's not slight. You know, it's not slight. So it, it's not in a pattern of back migration either. Even if it was, you don't have a population that is homogenous because it's not just R and H. It's damn near all European Afro groups. DO is now found in Africa. C is found in Africa. CF, the mutations for it, the actual haplogroup, isn't found anywhere. But if you look at like these maps, these back migration maps like this and this, and I got to throw in my maps, because if you look at my maps and actual statistical clines that, that computers will generate, you'll see that, it, that the maps that I created, these two, where I try to be more objective, look more like the statistical clines. It looks more like a cline. You know, in that little image right there in the middle of Africa, that right there, that's Africa relating to itself. The green one is Africa relating to out of Africa groups. Now look at the green one and compare it to these images. It's, you see that it has, it's sort of its own thing, but it's climbing out of Africa. Like the, these have a group right here, MTDNA. If you were to look at this, you would think you'd only have L2, L3, L1, and L. N is found in Africa. M is found in Africa. I, J, K, T, U, V, H, U, X. All found. And the only ones, don't, like W, I would say, does has a, a back migration pattern. If you find it in Africa, it usually has a back migration pattern. U is kind of halfway. It's nested hard outside of Africa. It's nested in Africa. So you can't really say. And then if you go further out, like if you go with A, A is found in West Africa. The one that the A on this list, I'm not talking about Y chromosomal A. I'm talking mitochondrial A is found in West Africa. It's rare. And I think it, I, I saw it also a little bit on a heat map. 
you don't really have mitochondrial D that I know of, or B. Actually, even though it's South America, it, you could argue that it came out of North Africa. It's, it's low branched in North Africa. Then you look at the Y chromosomal haplogroups, and it's damn near all of them, really, except for pure D. I mean, once you found C, that, that's pretty much it. That's all the mutations. Like I said, it, it, genetically, Africa is, if, it's, if you compare it to your hand, it's everything but the tip of your pinky. And I don't want to go too deep into this. This is sort of outside of the subject, but on bleeding sources, this this is like this is crazy that they're sticking to this sixty to seventy, fifty to forty thousand years people left in small bands, and that they're basing that model on um, Neanderthal integration. That is where I'm saying that population genetics is is flawed. It's broken. You know, because I, I can get if you go to the phylogenetic tree and you start looking at these people, you'll notice that the Sarahari and the and Mozabites, when they're isolated, they're more related to themselves and their sub-Saharan African either neighbors, who a lot of times are Mende, or um, ancestors who who it looks like might be more related to Cushitic Africans. They're more related to them than Europeans. So this isn't North, even North Africa. Egypt's kind of different because it was invaded by the big, you know, big, big, um, empires but tunisia um morocco they're mostly related to north africans they're mostly related to themselves and europeans so who would have invaded them morocco was more related to moroccans than, than saudi arabians so why do people keep saying that morocco is is a uh, is arabian morocco ain't arabian that's just how the people look you know europeans came from a mulatto looking group of people they did not create a mulatto looking group of people by my back migrating and mixing with uh, more common featured Africans. And I can go deep into that. The, like I said, on that note, it's my domain. The evidence is strong, ridiculous. Because you can look at Cushitic looking people like this is a Tanzanian. That's a Tanzanian. How how much different does he look than those ancient Libyans? You know, how far are, are how far away are they? North Africa is just like that. You know, it's, you just got some light skinned people, you got light skinned genes in North Africa indigenous because they're related you you got the same light skin genes in place like tanzania where you have crazy amounts of alb albinism so i'm just saying consider this consider that population genetics could be very wrong just like linguistics you know and i know you got to check the young bozos and the cocaine callaways and all that even clyde winters and i think this is one area where clyde winters has some this is more than that clyde winters ain't no fool but he when he saw the Abu Sir haplogroups, he was like, oh, it's Cushitic. Later on, people started looking at him deeply. They were like, oh, this is a more indigenous Egyptian group, you know, related to Cushitic people and all that. He, you know, he was on, on that right away. I do still think it was picked because it was Cosmo you know, with people coming in and all that. They were too related to Bedouins and they were too diverse in their out of Africa relation. So, you know, that was the spot. Plus, you do have Semitic burials up the Yang there, and like the Saramotep said, they didn't give any names. This last thing I want to show, it shows that your uh, Southern Europeans are the most diverse Europeans. Because if you look at the Southern Europeans, they got a little bit of that African red and yellow that you see with the Egyptians, you know, and, and the Tunisians, Middle East, because they got the Middle East right there, and that that red that's mostly African. But they also like if you look at the Southern Europeans. They got all the Northern European stuff, too. Europeans are a Mediterranean-derived people, genetically. They are, and that's the thing. Like, this is related to the whole Caucasian myth. Like, they went up into the snow, and it's, it's all based on an old narrative that is constantly disproven. Whenever they, every study that's coming out is showing that ancient Africans are related to Europeans, and it's not in a pattern of back migration to shoehorn something else that is not shown by the um, raw data, you get a persistent narrative that'll tell you that, hey, you know what, these Neanderthal variants, they're really African, but they still came and mixed with Neanderthals because uh, 23 of me is making money off it. Like, th that's where we're at. And I'm just saying, consider this, because if I'm wrong, you know, it's just me. It's just me. If I'm wrong, it's just me. If I'm right, then we got a major problem and I'll co-sign it. I'm saying step back as messed up as linguistics is. Believe me, population genetics, mainstream population genetics 
is just as bad. When you see pictures like this, you know that some people get it. Some people know what's going on. 